He was unbeatable at the box office, even outselling Muhammad Ali in Los Angeles. Considered invincible inside the ring, but incorrigible outside of it, his toughest opponent was named Tequila. With a charismatic personality that transcended the sport, he thrilled fans with his one-punch lightning, a fighter they called. Ruben Olivares was born in Mexico City on January 14, 1947. As a young boy, Ruben had his hair cut by his father, who camouflaged the uneven cut by brushing out the top, making him look like a hedgehog. The peculiar hairstyle prompted the neighborhood kids to give him the nickname El Puas in reference to the spikes in his hair. Thrown out of school because of fighting by the age of 15, he spent a lot of time loafing around in shooting pool. His father didn't like where Ruben's life was headed. Get a job or go back to school or leave the house, his father said. We'll have no bums living around here. Ruben then found work as a wood carver for $2.40 a week. He cut wooden statues of three wise men, Don Quixote and the Cisco Kid. Problem was, Ruben didn't possess any artistic talent. He carved out disfigured eyes and ears. He did a horrible job on the halo ring of Our Lady of Guadalupe and made her look as if she were hit over the head with a frying pan. His work opportunities limited. His friend named Fernando Cid decided they should become professional fighters. The two joined a boxing gym where they met trainer Manuel Chilero Carrillo, who taught him the basics of the sport and realized that Ruben was a natural. He came to me when he was 16, Carrillo said, and from the start, he had that confidence. Olivares became a sensation in the amateurs and often used psychology on his opponents. At amateur fights, all the fighters dressed in the same room, Carrillo said. Ruben would look at the program to see who he was fighting, and then he'd say, Who is so-and-so? I feel sorry for you, you poor guy. You're gonna die. Then when they lined the fighters up for the weigh-in, Ruben would stand behind his opponent and say, What are you shaking for? You know you're gonna die, but be a man about it. Ruben won the local Golden Gloves, but failed to qualify for the 1964 Olympics in Tokyo. Now under the guidance of manager Cuyo Hernandez, Olivares decided to turn professional at the age of 17. His success was immediate as he won 27 straight fights with 26 by knockout before being held to a draw by Herman Bastidas. Ruben knocked out Bastidas six months later in a rematch. By August of 1968, he was touted as Mexico's newest sensation, defeating Salvatore Baruni, Octavio Gomez, and Tiny Palacio. His popularity soon surpassed that of his countrymen Chucho Castillo and Jose Napoles because he had the knockout punch that drew fans to the arena. I don't expect a knockout every time, Olivares said, but if it comes, it comes. Trainer Carrillo noted that Olivares wasn't the hardest hitter in Mexico, but he knew how to hit the right spots. There is a spot on the chin and another on the body that will put a fighter out, Carrillo said. Ruben knows these spots. Promoter George Parnassus saw the star potential in Olivares, bringing him from Mexico and showcasing him at the Forum in Inglewood, where Olivares became a star and a party animal in Los Angeles. Olivares collected many girlfriends driving around town in the latest hot rod. In the ring, he was Mr. Excitement, getting knocked down then getting back up to knock his opponents out. In March of 1969, he was floored in the second round against Ernie De La Cruz, only to get up and knock Cruz down four times en route to a ninth round stoppage. 
Two months later, he stopped Takao Sakurai in six rounds in an elimination bout for the bantamweight title. On August 22, 1969, Olivares challenged Australia's Lionel Rose for the world bantamweight title. Australian news reporters noted that Olivares looked sluggish during training and felt optimistic about their countryman's chances. But Olivares would prove that his consistently poor performances in the gym were not an omen of things to come. The fight grossed over $270,000, a record for the forum at the time. Promoter Parnassus officially had his number one box office superstar, and Mexico crowned its new hero. Four months later, Ruben stepped in against the United Kingdom's Alan Rudkin, with many believing that it would be a competitive fight. But Olivares ended things like an executioner, cutting Rudkin down with a vicious left hook, which left the challenger motionless on the canvas. I've never been hit so hard in my life, Rudkin said. In April of 1970, Ruben defended his title against the popular Chucho Castillo, a fighter whose lifestyle was a stark contrast to his own. Reclusive and moody, Castillo rarely spoke to the press. But he had his share of fans in Mexico as many believed that he had been robbed of his title against Lionel Rose. Many were upset that Olivares made Castillo wait before he gave him his title shot. Castillo brutalized his sparring partners in training, going straight to his room after his workouts were complete. Olivares, on the other hand, was the good life champ, entertaining girls, and showing up to a press conference wearing a wig and oversized sunglasses. At a dinner party promoting the fight, he impersonated one of the waiters and collected tips in the bowl. The press hyped up the bout as the party boy versus the Spartan, and the Mexican fans had divided loyalties. The fight itself saw Castillo gain the upper hand in the early rounds, Flooring Olivares in the third, but Olivares rallied and took the decision. Three months later, Olivares traveled to Chicago to perform in front of over 7,000 Mexican fans who came out to cheer his efforts against an unknown Japanese fighter named Suji Chiyoda. Olivares was unprepared and overweight at 124 pounds, laboring to a decision over an opponent that many in the audience thought he should have knocked out. The lackluster effort was the writing on the wall for Olivares' first defeat. Rematched with Chucho Castillo, Olivares once again looked sluggish. He was cut early in the fight, claiming that it came from a headbutt, while the challenger insisted that his punches caused the damage. Olivares mounted a middle rounds comeback, but the ringside doctor kept checking into his corner about the cut until he finally ordered that the fight be stopped in the 14th round, giving Olivares his first defeat. Six months later, the two rivals faced off for the third and final time. A crowd of over 18,000 jammed into the form as Olivares gave Castillo a boxing lesson, fighting from long range. This new strategy confused Castillo, and aside from a knockdown he scored over Olivares in the sixth round, the defending champion was never able to mount an offense. The Associated Press scored it 12 rounds to one in favor of Ruben as he regained his crown. Olivares hated training, and promoter Parnassus and trainer Carrillo agreed that they had to keep the champion busy. In August of 1971, Olivares shared the same card as the popular Jose Napoli's at the Forum, but had to survive a third round knockdown before checking out Kid Pasqualito. Two months later, he traveled to Japan for a rematch against Kazuyoshi Kanazawa. The fight was close until the ninth when Kanazawa tired badly. By the 14th, he was fully spent and Olivares went to work.
In December of 1971, Olivares came back to the Inglewood Forum to defend against the popular Jesus Pimentel. It was the 31-year-old Pimentel's first shot at the title as he waited almost 10 years for this chance. Pimentel hurt Olivares at the start and raced to an early lead until Olivares decked him in the sixth. From there, the outcome was never in doubt. These victories now put Olivares into an elite class of fighter, as many now saw him as one of the greatest bantamweights of all time. The WBC selected him as its Boxer of the Year for 1971. But by March of the following year, Olivares' struggle to make the 118-pound weight limit had taken its toll. He signed for a title defense against Rafael Herrera and vowed it would be his last fight as a bantamweight. The decision came one fight too late. Olivares was reportedly not in shape and Herrera took full advantage. The challenger was cold and calculating throughout, stopping the champion in eight one-sided rounds. I'm sorry I beat you, Herrera said to Olivares after the fight, but I need the money. I just couldn't make the weight, Olivares said. It left me weak to train that low. Discouraged, Olivares quit the sport before deciding to make a return five months later. Moving up to the featherweight division, he rematched Herrera who had lost the bantamweight title four months earlier. Olivares once again seemed to lack steam in his punches until the final rounds when he fought like a man who knew he was behind. But it was too little, too late, as Herrera once again outjabbed and outmaneuvered Olivares, winning a majority decision. Despite the defeats, Olivares was still revered by the Mexican fans. He made starring appearances in various movies and made nightly appearances at all the discos. One reporter asked if he still drank, and Olivares replied, only when I'm drunk. Olivares had become a man of wealth in a very short period of time. In less than two and a half years, he had earned over $800,000 for 10 fights. In June of 1973, he was brought in as an opponent for the undefeated Bobby Chacon. I have to be serious, Olivares said. I had my fun before. Olivares was confident before the bout. He had scouted Chacon and noticed that the young fighter stood too straight up and wouldn't be too hard to hit. He saw that Chacon routinely dropped his left hand after jabbing, an opening for his own right cross.
Olivares called out his critics after the win. They say I do too much nightlife, Ruben said, but I've always fulfilled my duties in the ring. Less than three months later, the critics were vindicated when Olivares was stopped in five rounds by Art Hafey. Hafey floored Olivares three times and the former champion asked for the fight to be stopped. Prior to the bout, Ruben had been making a movie in Mexico and stated that he wasn't in condition. But the reporters called the excuse weak, citing that he had asked for and received a 10-day postponement for the bout, which should have been enough additional time to get in shape. Legal troubles followed as sports writer Jim Murray reported that Olivares was accused of rape by a girl, a charge that the boxer was later cleared of in a Mexico City court. Then in October of 1973, Olivares was jailed for 72 hours as his gun was used in a killing of a high school student. That charge was also dropped because of a lack of evidence. Court battles now behind him, Olivares returned to the ring, once again taking on Art Hafey, even though he had no desire to face the hard-hitting Canadian again. Olivares fell behind early, but then utilized some hit-and-run tactics which impressed the judges enough to gift him with the decision. The victory earned him a shot at the vacant featherweight title as he took on Senzuki Utagawa for the championship vacated by Ernesto Marcel. A champion again, the Mexican crowd rejoiced in Olivares' victory, so much so that a riot ensued and one security guard was knocked unconscious. Ruben was back on top of the boxing world, and his options seemed limitless. His manager Pancho Rosales wanted a title unification with Bobby Chacon, who had won the WBC crown. Olivares wanted to star in a movie as the romantic lead opposite Raquel Welch. But what he got instead was a date in the ring with budding legend Alexis Arguello. The odds makers made it an even money bout. Olivares, who had sparred with Arguello three years earlier, didn't promise victory as he so often did before. I will leave the predictions to Muhammad Ali, Olivares said. Arguello himself had nothing but respect for El Puas. Ruben Olivares has always been my idol, Arguello said. To me, he was the best that bantamweight boxing has ever had. I got careless in the 13th, Olivera said after the stoppage. I got caught with an uppercut, and instead of trying to shake the cobwebs, I went at him. Big mistake. 
Olivares didn't remain a former champion long. Seven months later, he got the rematch against Chacon for the WBC featherweight title. Chacon came into the ring in a weakened state, and Olivares attacked like a shark smelling blood. Do you want to fight one more time? Olivares asked Chacon after the bout. No, Chacon said. I cannot make the weight anymore. Besides, you have too much heart. Olivares then returned to Mexico and resumed his partying lifestyle. Between fights is the opportunity for a good time, Olivares said. If I were an old man, I wouldn't do what I do. Three months later, Olivares defended his title against the unknown David Kotai of Ghana. Olivares' confidence returned as he predicted a knockout within 10 rounds. He also continued making movies, having fellow actor Ricardo Montalban by his side to interpret for him at a Los Angeles press conference. But the hot and cold Olivares once again came up cold. Kotai floored Olivares in the opening round and took the fight to the champion. Olivares seemed more concerned about Kotai's dirty tactics throughout as the pair butted heads and the Mexican came out with a cut over his eye. Ruben tried to play to the crowd, but his antics didn't impress the judges. Kotai was announced as the split decision winner, and the crowd of over 8,000 Olivares fans began to riot. For over 30 minutes, they booed and threw objects into the ring. Once again an ex-champion, Olivares returned to the ring less than three months later to face the hard-hitting Danny Little Red Lopez. Olivares was installed as the 10-8 favorite and after receiving a pre-fight kiss from actress Edie Williams, he came out invigorated, flooring Lopez in the first round. But 30 seconds later, Lopez returned the favor before ending matters in the seventh. The loss erased all hope for a rematch with David Kotai. This would be the best time for Ruben to retire, manager Cuyo Hernandez said. I'll advise him to do that, but I don't think he will. On the contrary, now he wants to continue more than ever. A reporter asked Olivares if he was going to retire and the fighter replied, No, why? Olivares took off six months from the sport before signing a deal with a new and wealthy young promoter named Rogelio Robles. Robles owned a tortilla company and signed the Mexican Idol for four fights. The first fight was supposed to be against Paget Lupicanet, the featherweight champion of Thailand. Instead of Lupicanet, he faced an imposter named Chironsek Pornsangafa and stopped him in less than three minutes. Olivares now had his sights set on the newly created 122-pound junior featherweight crown. Promoter Robles promised Olivares a new Ferrari if he ever won another championship. I have given Mexico four championships, Olivares said. This one won't be for Mexico. It will be for me. Mexico has treated me very badly. They must have taken away five of my cars, all except a van and a 1972 Mustang which I have hidden. When I get my Ferrari, I will leave it here in Los Angeles. But the losses continued. Olivares was stopped in six rounds by Jose Cervantes in a 122-pound title eliminator. 
He then blamed his poor performance on excessive weight loss. I felt weak, Olivera said to reporters. I was too weak. Could I have a beer? Taking off over nine months, Olivera's got a rematch with Bobby Chacon. Chacon came in as an 8-5 to five favorite, but the crowd of 6,000 mostly cheered for Olivera's. Coming in at a bloated 130 pounds, Olivera's lost a decision. He looked lousy, said a member of his entourage. He's lost his desire. He's just in it for the payday. Olivares refused to retire. Leaving Los Angeles, he toured Texas and New Mexico, wanting a shot at either the featherweight or junior lightweight titles. He still maintained his playboy lifestyle and attitude, as when he found out California had given approval for women to work as seconds, Olivares once again expressed his desire to meet Raquel Welch, wanting her to work his corner. The former champion still had enough left to knock out future lightweight champion Jose Luis Ramirez in two rounds, and in July of 1979, his manager, Pancho Rosales, maneuvered him into a title match against Eusebio Pedroza. But Olivares looked like a washed-up 32-year-old as he flailed away at the 23-year-old champion. The fight turned into a beating by the 10th round, and Olivares' corner threw in the towel in the 12th. Ruben took four bouts in the next two years looking worse with each fight. He lost most of his money on frivolous living and bad business deals, which included developing a formula for growing hair. Now a man who once owned two salvage trucks, two taxi cabs, an upholstery factory, and two homes, now had to work as a fall guy for clowns inside a circus tent. He retired from boxing in 1981, had a brief comeback in 1986, and in 1988 had his final bout at age 41 getting knocked out in four rounds. In 1986, he was arrested on theft charges, entering a building which published his biography, From Hell to Glory. Olivares stole $250 and two pistols, stating that he wanted it as royalties for the sale of his book. Six months later, he was arrested for marijuana possession while fleeing police in Oaxaca, Mexico. Overtaxed by the Mexican government, money remained tight. Ruben often sat at a local supermarket where he charged for autographed boxing memorabilia. At one point, he put up one of his championship belts for sale on Craigslist, saying that, quote, the toughest and bloodiest fights are not in the ring, but outside of it. Inducted into the International Boxing Hall of Fame in 1991, Ruben now lives in the neighborhood of Impulsora in Mexico City. He maintains an upbeat and funny attitude about life, spending his days with his grandchildren and enjoying the home-cooked meals of his wife of over 50 years.